Hey, good morning, church. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I love all the conversation. It's God's people connecting. That's good. Well, we're here um, because we like hanging out with each other, certainly. And we're here because it's better to be inside than outside right now. 46 degrees, but it's beautiful. But more than all of those things, we're here to worship our living king this morning. So uh, before we do that, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get going with worship. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, oh, um, we're here for you this morning. We want to start our week by setting aside uh, a few hours just to come together as um, the church, the body of Christ, and um, start our week just acknowledging your kingship in our life, um, your leadership, and uh, God, this morning as we worship, we pray that that's what, what this would be about, is just us acknowledging our gratitude, our thankfulness for your goodness and your provision. And so, God, as we sing these songs, um, as we pray, as we look into your word, may all of these things come alive in us this morning. May they be more than words that just pass us by this morning, um, more than a moment that just kind of fades into another week. But, God, help us to, um, with intentionality this morning, Sing these songs of praise and thanksgiving. Open our minds to what you want to do in us and through us this morning. And um, help this to come alive in our hearts and to, to really connect with you this morning. So, God, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right. That's a big order this morning. In, in intentionality, connecting with our living God. So I want to invite you to your feet this morning and let's sing together. Yeah, that's good. So you're the band this morning. Tall order. So you got to be in it to win it. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you When you called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day And now your mercy has saved my soul. Your freedom. And now your freedom is all that I know. Come on, church. The old man knew. The old man knew. Jesus, when I met you, oh, then you called my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Y'all are feeling it this morning. It feels good in here. We're going to sing this. And claim this is our story this morning. 
I need a rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break out the weight of your glory. I need a shelter. I was an orphan, but you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open, because when you call my name, it's out of that. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, then you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over if my story's just begun. I feel you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. I feel you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, lay your burden. Ooh, here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, here in the Father's house. Arrival's not the end game. This journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. The failure's never final when the Father's in the room. The failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Prodigals come home, the helpless find hope. The love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the death come to life. The love is on the move when the father's. Come on, church. The miracles take place, the cynical find faith. The love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Jericho walls are shaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Well, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. We check your shame out the door. It ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Ooh, well, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door. It ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. 
Father's house. Amen. I invite you to sit just for a second. Um, I, I want to. We're going to continue in worship for sure. I just want to welcome you as well. Good to see some uh, certainly familiar faces and some some guests as well. Glad that you are finding your way in this place to indeed hear the Father's voice. Maybe throughout this week you are hearing another voice in your ear, and this is just a reminder for you to be at the Shepherd's table, to be at the Lord's table, and to come and and I know. David is actually going to be bringing a word today. That's why I'm holding this microphone rather than the normal piece that I have because David is actually bringing a, a message from uh, the, the 34th Psalm today. And uh, it's going to remind that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And for us to be able to come to the table and to be able to hear a word from him, just grateful for that. I do want to give you a couple quick announcements um, just as we continue in worship. Um, these are ministry opportunities. This is what we believe that makes us disciples of Jesus Christ. Not that we come gather only on a Sunday morning and come sing some songs for an hour, but that we every single day in and out of relationships and fellowships and study opportunities. Uh, um, I'm looking back at Mark because he's, he and the youth are going to be hosting this bocce tournament. Uh, we need to be signing some of, some of you all up. I believe that the sign up opportunities are on the website so if you go to the website you can actually uh, click on this and sign up just need to raise your hand if you've played bocce before okay so everybody can do it. it's lawn bowling super easy but this is an opportunity for us to intergenerationally be able to hang out and spend some time together this is how we grow in our faith this is how we you know how we get to hang out and this is going to be February 13th from noon until 3 at the same time is going to be a children's event called John 316. And this is going to be a gospel opportunity for our children, uh, preschool through fifth grade. If you're not that, I'm sorry, you're not invited. That's why you got to be at the, um, if you're an adult in this place, then if you're a child, if you're a youth, you have something to do on that February 13th. I know it is uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, but before you go to whatever party you're doing, hopefully with the box there, uh, that you'll come here and you'll stay here and that you'll be able to have an opportunity to fellowship and hang out with your children, with your youth as well. And then the third announcement for me is this opportunity called The Chosen. Uh, some of you have seen this uh, video. Um, it's a TV show that is a, an opportunity to worship that's done really, really well. It's about 45 minutes for each episode of this. Now they're working on season three of this, but we're bringing it back to season one. Whether you've seen it or not, this is an opportunity for us as a church to be able to engage God's word, but in a fun and kind of relevant way in that we get to watch the study on a Sunday night from 5 to 6.30 for eight weeks. Uh, it's going to be involving children and youth and adults and food while we get to gather in this place, watch the video, and then be able to open up God's word and talk about what Jesus was doing in his ministry for these three years. And so we're going to follow that story and hope that you'll be uh, join us for that. Sunday nights beginning February 20th. Somebody asked me last uh, last service, wait, is that is football season over yet? I said, yes, football season is over. I understand priorities with this. It's the week after. So I hope that you all will join. There's an opportunity to sign up for that online as well. Um, last announcement is that we have an opportunity to serve our veterans. Uh, we care greatly about our veterans in the area, and we have Valdemero Lopez uh, right down the road. And uh, Stephanie Mosier is kind of leading the charge on some of our community events, and that's a way that we are going to be able to love on our veterans right down the road. For Valentine's Day, we can't find our way onto campus and to shake hands and to show our appreciation, but that doesn't mean that we can't write a Veterans Day, uh, a Valentine's Day card for our veterans and just love them. So next Sunday and the Sunday after that, in the lobby, you will see Stephanie out there. And I'm looking at the Mosiers back there. I'm sure that they're roped into this too, and which is a good thing. And so opportunities for us to continue to love our veterans and our community and what we're called to do. Um, I do want to remind that we are continuing to 
uh, worship not only in song and opening up God's word, but also in our faithful giving. And so we do have opportunities to give online. For those of you who are worshiping online, you can certainly write a check and send that in the mail. You can do it online. For those of you who are here, you can text to give. We aren't passing the plate during the service, but we do have boxes at both entrances. And so uh, as you come and as you leave, uh, I do want you to continue to remember your faithful giving in that as well. Um, it, with that, let me uh, turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just give you thanks for these opportunities that we there are opportunities for discipleship, for our children and youth and adults to be able to fellowship together, to get to know one another, for us to be able to uh, encourage one another. And Lord, we're looking for that even this morning. We come in here perhaps finding ourselves in the midst of trials or as David's going to bring a word to talk about living in this cave and finding yourself in the dark, uh, these dark places. God, we come here for refuge. We come here to hear a word from you not to gain information, but to seek transformation through your Holy Spirit. We believe that that is possible. And God, we know that that happens not only through your spirit, but through one another. And so as we encourage one another, as we sing songs to you, we pray, God, that you would sing them back down over us, that you would lighten our load, that we would take your yoke upon us, and that we would uh, know that you are in this place, in this moment, and meeting us right where we are. We give you thanks and praise and all these things. And the church says, amen, amen. All right, you want them to stand back up, Chris? Let's stand, let's, come on, stand up. You definitely worship better standing, scientific. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul. No work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Come on, church, sing it out. Well, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope, hallelujah. In every chain, salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. 
Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. Let's sing that again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. And Jesus, yours is the victory. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. My words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end. And you never do. Sing this out, church. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, a hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else before a king. Set for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. And I've got one response, I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. Come on, church. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, a hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else before a king. For heart singing, Hallelujah, 
Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside of those songs Get up and praise the Lord So come on my soul So don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside of those songs Get up and praise the Lord you all don't sound very convinced to me yet that you've got a lion inside of you and you're ready to praise the Lord. So we're going to try this again like these words are true. Let's see it. So come on, my soul. So don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Because you got a lion inside of those songs. Get up and praise the Lord. I know you've got more. Come on. Come on, my soul, so don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those songs, get up and praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, a hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else before a king. Except for heart singing hallelujah, a hallelujah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, a hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for hearts singing Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, that's our song this morning. We have nothing to offer you. The God of creation, the God of the universe, we feel sometimes so small. But what we do have, we offer to you a heart of gratitude and thankfulness. So now, God, as we look into your word, we ask that you would open our eyes and our ears to what you want to say to us this morning. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning, church. I got to tell you this morning, thank you, Chris, um, Pastor Kevin, I know how you, how you feel now when you come pray. What, what a wonderful time of worship, amen, and song. Gosh, that's just beautiful. Um, we are continuing with the series, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. And I love the, the subtitle, it's, it's Time to Win the Battle of Your Mind. We're going to be opening our Bibles to Psalms 34. But before we do that, why don't we go ahead and just uh, give this time to God. And that he may talk to us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. It's truth. Father, uh, we just pray that we, you may open our minds, our hearts, our soul, our own bodies to listen to your word and above all be doers of it. Thank you that you are God of truth. And we dedicate this time to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Psalms 34 is written by David before he was king. He was uh, but a young man. Uh, but before we go into Psalms 34, we're going to be reading it. But before we go there, I want to give you a little backstory on David's life. Uh, as, a, as a musician, as, as someone that's written songs before, I always like to know the story behind the story, right? The story behind the song. So I wanted to start off with a little bit about David and then where he's at this time as, as he's writing this, this song, Psalms 34. 
So David, as a young man, was uh, anointed by Samuel to be king of Israel. Uh, at the present time, it was King Saul, the first king of Israel. He wasn't doing too well. He disobeyed God a lot. God told him to do one thing. He did the opposite. So Samuel comes to David and says, you're going to be king. Scholars say he was about 15, 16 years old. Um, he was a shepherd. He was the youngest of all his brothers. He was a musician, which I kind of like that uh, for obvious reasons. He was a musician. Um, and then something happened. There was a big, huge man. I think most of you know this story name. Goliath. Goliath. Very good. And he was from Philistine from the city of Gath. Now keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that. Nobody wanted to fight him. Scholars think he was about nine foot tall. And David, they think he was about five five, five, four, so uh, not, a, not a very tall man. Um, but what happens? David goes and says, by, by the power of the Lord, and he, he beats Goliath, and he wins. What happens after that? Things, things start going really well for David. He becomes a leader in Israel's army. He had much success, lots of victories, so things are going really well for him. He marries the king's daughter, so he's really doing well. Um, he's living in a, in a castle, in a palace now, so once again, People loved him. And then they said they started singing songs about him. Uh, something along the lines of, King Saul, you killed your thousands, but David, you killed your ten thousands. So think of David as a young man, as a child. He becomes a champion. He lives in a castle. But then something interesting happens. And what is that? That King Saul gets jealous. And King Saul says, I can't believe that they're singing about David, not about me. So he throws a spear at him. David quick on his reflex, moves the other way and starts running. And all of a sudden, David becomes a fugitive. So hundreds of men looking after David. He was going this way in life, doing really well, and all of a sudden, King Saul just gets really jealous of him and starts, he starts running away. What does David do? So David goes to the priest, goes to church, which is good for David, right? We're in trouble. Where do we go? We go see the pastor. We go see leaders. We go to the church. But it's interesting what he asked the priest. He asked for two things. He asked for food, of course, physical food, and he asked for weapon. So the priest says, well, I have some bread here, so I'll give you some bread for your journey. And he lies to the priest. He doesn't tell him that King Saul's after him, after him or his men. And he gives him Goliath's sword. Now, Goliath, like I said, was about nine foot tall. So imagine how the sword was probably about this tall. So it would be interesting to see a five foot five young man carried this big old huge sword on him. And David has this great idea, and he says, you know where I'll go? I'm not going to stay in Israel because the king's here, and they, he's trying to kill me. I'm going to go to Gath, where Goliath was from. Nobody will recognize me there. Great, great idea, right? Uh, he's taking matters into his own, his own heart. His own heart. So he goes and goes to Gath, and then someone starts recognizing him and says, wait a minute. Isn't this David, the one that everyone's singing about, and you know, he killed his 10,000s? He takes him to the king of Gath, and David, quick on his feet, what does he do? He lies, he pretends, he pretends he's, he's insane. He acts all crazy in front of the king. The king doesn't say, who is it? This isn't David. Just kick him out of here. He gets kicked out of Gath. He doesn't have nowhere to go. And that's where David is. He's a fugitive, and he hides in a cave. So think about this, recapping David's life. Child, champion, living in a castle. Going like this in life, everything's solid. It's almost like, I, I would compare it, if you got that job, you're getting paid what you wanted, and you're just really excited. And then all of a sudden, he goes to a cave. So it's kind of like going this way, thank you, God, thank you, God, boom. And he's in a cave by himself where he's, um, it's cold, it's dark, there's no one around. Later on in, in his story, it says that 400 men came. So you think, that's great, 400 men to help out David. But the Bible says that these men, get this, they were discouraged, distressed, and in debt. I can't imagine uh, pastoring that church, right? <laughs> you know, you don't feel good about yourself. You're going through issues, and you have 400 guys that aren't going through. The, are going through probably worse, worse than you. So going on David's feelings. So what do we get? He is a fugitive. He's alone. He's scared. He's uncertain about his future. Can't compare it like if God told you, God gives you a promise, and everything's going towards that promise, and all of a sudden, that promise is no longer. And a lot of times, we are in the cave of life, and that's where we find David. He was worried, fearful, he was sorrowful, hopeless probably, and probably felt defeated. Um, 
And one key thing that I would put add into there is that he was brokenhearted. I think that's something that we could all relate to. You see, King Saul, he calls him father. He had a strong relationship with the king before the king got jealous of David. And he calls him father. And King Saul would call him son. So imagine someone in your life that you love, that you hold so dear, and he betrays you. What goes through your mind? What goes through your heart? What feelings? Whatever that is, that's what David was feeling right now. And that's where I want to read Psalms 34. So if you could open your Bibles, or like Pastor Kevin said last week, I like it. Uh, what did you say? Turn on your Bibles as well. Psalms 34, 22 verses. We'll go through it, and we'll have four points for you this morning. Psalms 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. This is David writing the song. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you, his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord, who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have broken heart and save such that have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall, stay, shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. So I have four points this morning. It's interesting when we go into verse, verse 1, how David starts his song. So keep in mind, David is alone, he feels betrayed, he's brokenhearted, he's sad, there's a lot of sorrow in him. And how does he start when we go to verse 1? He starts with, I will. He takes it upon himself that it's a choice of whether to look into the Lord's praiseworthiness or his position. He looks into the Lord's praiseworthiness. Is the Lord praise worthy of praise or is it my position? Like, which one is it? And David, keep in mind, he was in a cave. He, he, the Lord hadn't answered him yet. He answers him later on. But he wasn't in the cave at the time he was writing this, this song. He makes a choice. And he says five things. Bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Boast in the Lord. Magnify the Lord. And exalt the Lord. When you bless the Lord, you're making him a priority in your life. He was making God a priority, even though his position, his, his surroundings was not was not what anyone wanted. He praised the Lord. When we talk about praise, we talk about the works of that person, in this case, the works of the Lord. He saw that the Lord was working even in the cave. The Lord didn't give him a solution. At that time when he was writing this, it's, it's not, when I read this the first time, it's like, oh, this must be, it's almost like when you see a Christian and, and a, a child of God and they're so happy and you think everything must be going right for them. But it wasn't. Not for David. But he made it a choice. I will. He will boast in the Lord. He talked highly of God. Even in the cave. Even in the darkness and the cold. Even in the cave. He boasts in the Lord. And I love when he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. He was probably talking to the 400 men that were discouraged, distressed, and in debt. You know, just like when we worship, and it's beautiful to hear the voices. And I know it's more than the voices. It's the hearts that are claiming to God, worshiping him. That's what David was saying. Now, here's the thing. When we use a magnifying glass, is the object turn greater when we use the magnifying glass? Is the object growing? No. What's, what's, what's the difference? Say it. The what? The way you see it, the perception, the way you view it. 
when David says, oh, magnify the Lord with me, and he's sad, he's distraught, he's brokenhearted, he's contrite in spirit, he feels defeated. What happened to the promise? God, you told me I was anointed. What's going on? You, you helped me with Goliath. You helped me with all those victories in the battle, but now I'm in the cave. He's telling everyone, you know what? I might be in the cave. 400 men, you might be in the cave with me, but let's look at God differently. Our view is not in this cave of God. Not here. What does he do with the cave? He makes it a chapel. He makes it a chapel. It's a communion with God and with those around him. You know, it's beautiful to see that we could all look at God differently. If you think God's this big, well, guess what? God's this big. If you think God's this big, well, he's much greater than that. It's to magnify him daily, to look at him at the seat of the table in fellowship and communion with him. Beyond the fact that you might be in the cave or maybe coming out of the cave or maybe going into it, wherever you might be in life, the cave of life does happen because we live in a sinful world. And I love the fact, and then he exalts, and he exalts together. You know, he's not doing this by himself. He knows there's 400 men that are probably in bad shape too. But he says, you know what? My position that I'm being chased after, I'm, I'm not going to see that. I'm going to see what God is. And there's four attributes that I'd like to leave with you this morning as far as when we look to God, like what, is it that, what makes him praiseworthy? The first thing, he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's more powerful than the problem. You see, in my life, what happens is sometimes I put the problem here and the, um, and the omnipotent, uh, the all-powerful is down here. But I have to change the way I magnify the Lord. God is, God is greater and more powerful than the problem that we're going through. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He understands what you're going through. You see, he sent his son, Jesus. Jesus experienced death. He experienced loneliness. Heart, heartache. And God says, I sent, I sent my son so I could understand, so you can understand that I am with you. He understands. He's all-knowing. He understands the situation. He understands your cave. And this is the beauty of it, church, that God understands the cave even when we don't understand the cave. Amen to that. I know in my life I've been in a cave, in a situational cave. I don't get it. Lord, why? That's the first thing I ask. But really, the question is who? Who is with you? Not the why, but who? And that who is God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, every time. He is with you. And he's perfect, and, un and he's unlimited good goodness to you. So that's the first. The second point is we have to look in the Lord's protection versus our preservation. Verse 4 says that he sought the Lord. He answered and delivered me from all my fears. Now remember, where was he when he wrote this? In the cave. Did God deliver him yet from the cave at this moment? No. But yet David says, you deliver me from all my, not from all my caves, from all my fears. See, a lot of times in my life, I'm looking at the cave and thinking, oh my goodness, the cave. Lord, why did you put me in this, this position? You know, I, I was a champion. I, I, was, I lived in a castle. You know, I followed you. I worked for you. I serve you. What? And God is saying, don't look at the cave. Look at me. That's what God is saying to us. Because he's going to deliver you from all your fears. Verse 6 says, the, this poor man, he's talking about himself. That's a humble cry. See, I always wondered, out of men in the Bible, the only one that is, is said that he's a man after God's own heart is of David. Now, if you know the story of David, David messed up quite a bit. I mean, he messed up really bad. Um, murder, adultery, fornication. I mean, my goodness, the, the list goes on. But why would God call him a man after God's own heart? So here's what I see when we look at David and his character, he was willing to own it. He was willing to own his sin, his disobedience. See, that's something we never saw of King Saul. King Saul, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry, I'll do it this time, I'll do it this time. But he wasn't willing to own it. David, when he messed up, when he disobeyed God, he didn't just say, Lord, I'm sorry, I confess. He turned it around, and he says, I'm willing to own the discipline. And that's a hard one to do, to say to the Lord, I, I, own, I own the discipline. Yeah, I, because sin has consequences. That is just, that, that's why God hates sin. 
doesn't hate the sinner, he hates sin because it brings consequences in our lives. But David was willing, that's why he was, and because there was humility there, there was transparency there in David's life. So when he says, this poor man, a humble cry, he says, the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Once again, where was he when he wrote that? In the cave. Because he, he knew that God would be with him. There was no doubt in his mind. He felt the cold. He saw the darkness in the cave. But he knew without a fact that God was there. Amen. He keeps all his bones and no one is broken. And the song... The blessing, we, we sang it here a few times. It comes from Numbers 6, 24 through 26. I love these words. May his presence go before you, go behind you, go beside you, go all around you, and within you. He is with you. He is with you. The other part is in the morning, in the evening, in the coming, in your going, in your weeping and rejoicing, he is for you. We could depend on God's protection because he is with you, not just to the side of you. Not, not, not just, he's, he's all around you. He's everywhere every time. If you're in a, in a castle of life right now and things are going well, he's there with you. If you're in the cave right now, he's there with you too because the word of God says so. The word of God says a man is not a liar. He's not a liar He's not like man. He doesn't lie. He doesn't tell you one thing and says, oh, well, no, I was just kidding. Or no, no, I'm not going to do that. If he says he's going to be with you, he is with you. He's a man of his word. He's a God of his word. The third point is we look to the Lord's provision versus our own produce. So a lot of times what we do at the table is the following. So we're going to the table, right? And the table is the relationship of our God and us in life. And we come, imagine this, imagine you invite, some, you invite me to your home, right? And um, you set up, you prepare everything, everything looks nice. But I come to the door, knock, you let me in. And I said, hey, I got some food. And you're like, oh, thank you. Oh, no, no, it's not for you, it's for me. No, I brought my own food. Thank you for, all, for everything that you prepared, but this is for me. And sometimes that's how we come in God, with our own pride. No, I, I got this, Lord. You know, I, I love John 3.16, for God so loved the world. I like that one. But I won't take the verse that says uh, I got to change and be more like Christ because I kind of like my pride and I like my son. So we come to communion with God as such. And we bring our own produce. So sometimes we bring. Everyone's all attentive. I love it. So because I'm smart, no, I'll bring some Smarties to the dinner. That's what I'll eat because I'm smart, right? Smarties. Yeah, I'll do that. And you know what? I like it my way, not God's way all the time. I mean, I come to church. That's, that's, that's good, right? But Monday through Thursday, I'm not really going to read the Bible and be in communion with God. Because I like it my own way. So I'll bring a Milky Way for me. Right? It's my way, yeah. And you know, I feel kind of extra. I mean, the world says I'm, I'm extra, right? So I'll bring some extra gum for my dinner. Um, and it's such long-lasting, so it, it must be if it's as long-lasting, right? And that's how we come to the table, right, of the Lord in our fellowship with him. And then... No, we kind of, or I kind of snicker about it because David knows, you know, God's good. He's good. Don't get me wrong. He's a great God. You know, created heavens and earth. I get that. But I like that. So I bring my own happy meal. Oh. And here's, here's the thing. Happiness is circumstantial, right? But the joy of the Lord it's regardless. You know why? Because there's trust there, and we know of his power and his strength, and he's always there for us, and his promises, and he never lies. So I settle for this. Imagine if I would eat all this for dinner, right? I'd get sick. Spiritually, a lot of times when we, quote, unquote, eat our pride and, and, and think, oh, I, I know, Lord. I, I've been going to church enough times, so I, I know it. I, I appreciate it. And, and we take the word of God like a menu, Right, I'll have the uh, John 3.16 for appetizer, for God so loved the world. I love that one. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, you know. Yeah, okay, I'll get that. But I, uh, no, no, I'm not going to get this one. The Bible's not a menu. It's not pick and choose. It's the word of God for each and every one of us. But God offers love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all in Jesus that's what he has to offer. The Bible talks about 
everlasting life. And we get that, right? We're passing through this world. One day we won't be here. We'll live with God eternally, everlasting. But it also talks about having abundant life. And that abundant life is with God, not just, he's such an awesome God, that the fellowship table, the communion with him, it's not just for a Sunday. He wants to be with you every single day, every single hour, every single minute. He wants communion with you. He wants you to sit down and just talk to him and have him talk through the word of God. Imagine if, he, if we served a God that only said, okay, it's just Sunday. Just meet with me on Sunday. That's, that's good. Hey, that's great. How would that relationship go if you just meet a person for one hour, once a week? It's not really going to grow. And if it does, it's going to grow for, <laughs> it's going to take a long time. But if we're doing every day the fellowship that we have with God, and we settle for, if we have his provision, and we don't settle for our own produce, but we settle for what the Lord has. And the last one is the Lord's promises versus our point of view. This is what David writes. And he uses the word fear, which really means obedience and worship. When we, when we fear, obey, worship God, he encamps around and delivers. That word that delivers is over and over again. Even though he was in the cave, got to remind you, I keep coming to that. It wasn't that his problem was, was resolved, and, and, and God does it later on in the story. But at the time that he wrote this, Psalms 34, he was right in the middle of it. The righteous, the eyes of the Lord are toward, um, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward your cry. You, see, you know how I see that? When you've gone to a restaurant and you kind of spot around, see who's there, see if anyone knows you, see if anyone sees you, what you're eating, and you spot a couple that maybe their first or second date, and they're not with the phone, they're just looking eye to eye, and you're thinking, yeah, I remember those days. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're still there. They're still there. Uh, I remember, and you see that, you know, and they gaze into their eyes, and then you even see the guy coming over and holds the hand of the girl. When David writes about that the Lord's eyes are on you, and he hears you and leans towards you, this is how I picture the Lord. You're here, and the Lord's right there. And he holds your hand and says, I know you're going through the cave. He reaches in. I understand. My son died on the cross. He suffered. He felt loneliness. I know what you're going through. Then he puts his arm around you and says, but I'm with you. I'm right here with you. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. That's how I see how David writes that. And all this was in the middle of the cave. He's still in the cave. The servants of those who take refuge, the Lord redeems the life and will not be condemned. In this book, my favorite chapter was chapter 4. And it talked about deadly lies exposed. That, that's the title of the, of the chapter. And it talked about five lies that the enemy says to each and every one of us. The first is the lie of comparison. You're not as good as that person. Yeah. David could have said, you know, I'm not as good as, as Saul. He's king. I'm still not king. I was anointed, but I'm still not king. I'm still a little kid, and I'm in a cave. The lie that you are doomed, there's no hope. Why, why do you go on? That's what the enemy says to each and every one of us. The lie of unworthiness, you're not worthy. You're nothing. You're dirt. That's what the enemy tells us. Fourth lie, lie of me against the world. Why do you go to church? Why do you bother talking to your family? They don't care about you. It's just you. You against everybody else. And the fifth lie that it talks about is lie that there is no way out. There's not a solution. Whatever you're going through, work, school, community, marriage, there, there's no solution. Why, why do you continue? That's what the enemy says to us. The Bible describes the enemy as the father of lies. He's a liar. And I want to compare these lies to the truth of God. And this is what God says. When you go through the lie of comparison, Psalms 139, 13 to 14 says, truth, it, the truth, excuse me, the truth is that you have been fearfully and wonderfully made by God. There's 7.9 billion people on this world. How many of you are there? That's how special you are, just one. 
7.9 billion people. And there's only one of you. That's how wonderful God is. He's God. He could have made a couple Kevins, five Davids. I know my family wouldn't like that, you know. <laughs> uh, but he didn't because you're that special. The way you were formed, the way you were created, your own DNA. God said, I'll just make one David. That's enough for his family. They'll make one Kevin. They'll make one of you because he, you're that special to him. So don't compare. Look into what God's doing and has done. That's only one of you out of 7.9 billion people. When he says that you're doomed, the enemy says, oh, you're doomed. Yeah, you're, you're done. You know, don't, you're in the cave. Come on. Get, don't worry about it. Just, just stay there. Well, Romans 15, 13 says, our hope and trust is in Almighty God. Romans 15, 13 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When he says you're unworthy, you come back with Galatians 4, 7. You're not a slave to sin anymore. You're a child of, you're a child of, one more time, you're a child of, that's what God tells you. If you've accepted Christ as your savior, yes, you're not slaves to sin. You're not slaves, you're a child, you're his child. He cares for you, even in the cave. Lie of me against the world. He is with you always, even until the end of the ages. Or in other words, Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said that as he was leaving this earth. I'm with you always. Even to the end of the, some versions say the end of the world, others say to the end of the ages. But he's with you. He won't let you go. And the last one, lie that there is no way out. We sing this song, but it's Waymaker. He is a Waymaker. God will make a way where there is no way. Isaiah 43, 15 and 16 says, God makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. Sometimes I forget, I'll be honest with you, that I'm just walking through this life. We're all walking through this life. We're all going to be walking through a cave. Not to a cave, to stay, but through it. And the beautiful thing about God is the relationship that he wants with each and every one of us, that he's with you. He's alongside of you. The more we have the scriptures in our life, the more we read them and meditate we learn from them. Like Pastor Cass said, it, you know, it's, it's more than information. It, it is transformation. That's what God wants out of us. And that we could only get the truth of God through his word. So to finish, we, we, we're at a cave, right? Let me go back. Child, I love this because it's all, they're all Steve's. I made it up myself. Child, champion, so lives in a castle. He's down in a cave. What does he do in the cave? You know what he does in the cave? What we should all do in the cave. He makes it a chapel. Communion with Christ. And you know what? He brought along those 400 men. I know in my life of caves that I've had and will have in the future just because we live in a sinful world, one of the beauties that God makes you go through the cave is to help others, to encourage others, Sometimes that's why you're in the cave. Sometimes it's not all about me. And just the way we started, I'll finish. How did David start that song? I will. You have an opportunity to say to God, today and every day, whether you're in a castle or in a cave, I will. His praiseworthiness, his protection, his provision, and his promises. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are always with us. You will never, ever leave us. And I thank God that you're a God of truth. So help us, Father, to have that communion and be seated at the table, Father. Table of relationship, of life relationship with you. Make it more than a Sunday for us. Make it more than, than once, once a week. Help us to just trust in you, Father. Understand your praiseworthiness, your protection, your provision, and your promises. And help us to act on it, Father, and live it. We love you and we praise you. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's sing that again. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. My living hope. We hadn't rehearsed this part of this. I don't know if Chris was expecting me to come up, but I wanted to come up just to express gratitude, certainly for Chris in leading us in worship. And certainly, absolutely. Certainly. And David in giving, bring us the word today as well. Um, these two are certainly spiritual leaders amongst us in our church, and that's really it, is a reminder for us that you do have the strength, you do have the power to be a champion for Christ. And last week we talked about being victorious and living out of a victory, not moving towards victory, not fighting for it, you know, you're not battling for it, you're battling from it. Uh, next week is a fifth Sunday, which means that for us, we've been trying to do kind of this testimony and praise thing, and so... We'll gather in here, and we'll get to hear some other stories, some stories, some people, part of our congregation, uh, two or three people who are going to be coming up here and sharing their story, their testimony of how God is working in their life. And for us this week, my prayer for you is just those two very simple words that David just offered, that David in the psalm offers, the, 23, uh, the 34th psalm, I will. You do have strength over what the enemy is going to speak into your ear this week. And I promise you it's coming. Just as we sure is that cave, that if you're not in it, you're in your way out of it or your way into it. Uh, I will. I can do something. You are not powerless. The same, same strength and power and Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is within you. You need to be reminded of that this morning. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for worshiping with us. Receive this blessing as those who know the Father, know the Son, know the Holy Spirit. When we go from this place filled with that strength and power and might, yes, maybe in the midst of a storm, maybe in the midst of a cave, but knowing that we are on our way through it and that the Good Shepherd guides us every step of the way. We pray this in his name. Amen. Go in his peace. Blessings. <laughs>